Actually kidding. <laughs> well, my name is Keith Knight. I'm a, the student ministries pastor here at Stonebridge, in case you don't know me. And I get the privilege of uh, leading us through Psalm 127 this morning. So if you'll turn there with me. We are in a sermon series called Journey to Joy in which we are traveling through the Psalms of Ascent and uh, seeing what God has for us. And along the way, the hope is that in encountering God's Word, we would ultimately have our eyes lifted up to Him and that we would experience the joy that comes in knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. That's, That's our hope. So one of the things that we would just begin with saying is if you're here today and you don't personally know Christ as Lord, if you haven't come to a point where you've made a decision to follow Jesus and only Jesus, our hope for you today would that you'd be, that you would discover the joy in following Jesus. And for those of us who know Jesus, we would hope that, uh, that our joy would be in knowing him on a deeper level and submitting our lives to his word. So in Psalm 127, we're going, to, uh, we're going to read this together. So if you'll stand with me as we read God's Word. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Father, we thank you for your word. Um, Lord, we thank you for communicating to us that, uh, that you did not keep yourself far from us, Lord, as we uh, are born into our sin and are willing participants in that, that you didn't just leave us there, nor did you utterly destroy us, but you have made a way for us to know you. You have given us your revelation and your word of how you yourself were clothed in flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, how you lived the perfect life, gave your life on the cross, destroying the power of sin and how you were lifted from the grave, destroying the power of death. And Father, as we encounter your word today, we pray that, that we might know you deeper, that we might be wounded by your word so that we might be healed by your grace and your mercy, which we find in the face of Christ. So Lord, I, I pray that we would humble ourselves and not only be hearers of the word today, but that we would go out and be doers of it as well. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. Now, as we go through, as we go through this psalm, uh, we've entitled uh, this particular psalm, Work, okay? So uh, there's a few things that we're going to address in this psalm. This psalm not only addresses work, but it also addresses anxiety and children. Now, if you have children, you're like, no, those three go together. <laughs> but there's an awful lot of sacred cows in this passage of Scripture. So we get to do some sacred cow tipping this morning. So that should be fun. So it might be fun to get a little bit injured because it's in the injury that we are then able to be healed by God's word. Yes, amen? Yeah, that was hesitant amens. I don't want to be injured. Work was given to us ultimately as a blessing in the garden. If you read the the Old Testament account in Genesis of, of how God creates and then he creates man and sets man in the middle of the garden and says, hey, Bubba, this is yours. You get dominion over this thing. You are the one who gets to take care of this. So God created and then he set man over it to take care of. And work was like, like a blessing, right? It was a, an honor for man to be able to invest in that. But in the fall, see, when Adam and Eve rejected God's order and said, no, you know what, we would rather be like you than know you, then work got a little messed up. And then after that point, it, be, it became a labor. It became, you get these words that we see in, in this psalm and in the whole book of Ecclesiastes, in fact, as toil. And as this psalm is, is from Solomon, written by Solomon, you will find that these, there's these words, there are these words that appear, right? Vanity, the, in vain, unless the Lord builds a house, the workers labor in vain, and toil, work. And, and Solomon would say himself, 
that, that he, he knew about the toil and the vanity of, of working when there wasn't a greater purpose behind it. And for a lot of us, work is a reality. There might be some of you in here today that you absolutely hate your job. Don't say amen, because your boss might be in here. Awkward. Some in here might hate your job. Some might love your job. Might love your job a little too much. Might love your career. Might see your identity as wrapped up in your career and in what you're building for yourself. And so many of us, we either like completely reject work or we get to the point where we're obsessed with work and it begins to be all that we think about and we can't really enjoy life because we're obsessed with this thing. And you know, something that's been interesting to me um, lately, there have been a couple news stories um, related to people who are high up in the area of finance. There have been a couple of like banker CEOs who have, who have taken their own lives because they didn't like the projection of where things were going and their whole life was wrapped up in finance and they thought, well, this is all going downhill and maybe I've made some bad investments and it's just time to, to end my life. And, and how sad is it that someone can be so wrapped up in their work and seeing it as who they are that if they didn't have that thing, their whole life would be gone. But that's where a lot of us live. We begin to identify ourselves with what we can build. You know, nobody knows greater about that than Solomon. Solomon built something that was amazing. And yet, in the end, Solomon said, it's all vanity. So as we encounter this psalm today, one of the things that that is going to hit us right in the heart, hopefully, is this idea of what it means to, to work and to build something and how we might get fooled by some false precepts of, of what life should really be like. Well, as we look at this, looking at verse 1 to begin with, we see that the Lord has promised to build His kingdom and not ours. The Lord has promised to build His kingdom. Look at verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Now, we could take house to mean a few different things in this passage of Scripture. It could have different, different applications. It could be, you know, David wanted to build a house for the Lord. David wanted to build a temple. and God said, no, you're not going to do it. Solomon, your son, is going to do it. And so Solomon got to build the house. But unless the Lord was the one who says, I want to build a house, the workers labor in vain. It could also mean a family, right? A small unit, a house. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. If God is not behind what we're doing, if we aren't basically behind what God is doing, then what we're doing is in vain. It's useless. It's meaningless. It has absolutely no meaning in an eternal sense. And we get fooled because we see like things happen, you know, we work and we build families and we're like, hey, it seems like everything's going really, really well. And we look at the temporal, we look at the now, and we're not thinking that one of these days, all this stuff that I'm acquiring, all these things that I'm building, ultimately, where do they go? You can't take them with you. And let's be honest, in the end, it doesn't matter what kind of legacy we've built. Most of us are going to be forgotten in the grand scheme of history. So what are we building? Unless the Lord builds the house, it's in vain. Well, how do I know this? Look at Scripture. You know, in, in Genesis, the people who were building the Tower of Babel, all humanity came together and built a tower and they said, come, let us build the Tower to the Heavens. And God was like, great job. Nope. Destroyed. Scattered. Right? Unless God was building it, it was in vain. It's not going to happen. In Malachi, the book of Malachi, the nation of Edom says, well, God has destroyed us, but we will rebuild. And God says, you will rebuild and I will tear down. Because that's not my desire. Entire nations can, can build up. But it's in vain. David wanted to build a temple for God. God said, you're not going to do it. Your son is going to do it. And even this temple that Solomon built, we see not only was it destroyed once, but even Jesus, as he walked by the temple and looked at it, and, and in speaking of the Jewish religious system and how that was associated with temple worship, said there's not going to be even one of these stones that's on top of another. That entire system is going to be torn down because you built it. You've turned it into something that's your kingdom. So even in religion, 
Unless God builds it, the labor's in vain. Well, not only does he say, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor and those who build it labor in vain. He says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And this is more like a nation. This, this idea of the Lord watching over the city is more of a governmental thing. And this is a great reminder to us because we see this all the time in churches, out of churches. People are ar- always arguing about which political system is the best or which political party is the best or which politician is the best. And the reality is, unless God is behind it, it doesn't matter. It's going to fail in the grand scheme of eternity. It doesn't matter how great you think a government is. If God's not behind it, it's going down. And there's nothing that we can do to stop it. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. You can have all the warnings that you want. You can have all the financial warnings. You can have all the security warnings. You can set up whatever you want. But unless the Lord is behind the protection of the city, it's in vain. You know, truth be told, all of us, all of us would love for God to come to us and go, hey, you just tell me what you want. What do you want me to build for you? What would you like? You tell me what your perfect life looks like, and I'm going to give it to you. And unfortunately, we even have some brands of Christianity that say that that's what Christianity is. You go to God, tell him what you want, God gives it to you because he's awesome. That's not Christianity. We would all love for God to come to us and and say, what would you like for me to give to you? And the truth is, we would do the same thing that Solomon did. Yes, Solomon built God a temple. He built God a house. But he spent twice as long building his own house. And then after he built his kingdom, he started worshiping himself. And it's a sad, sad tale because in all of the glorious things that Solomon built, they ultimately all fell. And even Solomon said, it was all vain. Because it wasn't really about God. It's really about Solomon. Many of us don't maybe think we want a kingdom, but we do think that we built our lives. There are a lot of people who are like, man, I worked hard. I, I toil, I labored, I've worked hard for what I have. Congratulations for having the ability to work hard because God gave it to you. If you're breathing today, you can thank the Lord. If you're strong physically, you can thank the Lord. If you are strong mentally, you can thank the Lord, but it doesn't make you a better person. And it reminds me of a, a tale in which Henry Nowen, some of you guys know, uh, used to work with extremely mentally disabled people. And one time he turned to a pastor as they were looking at somebody who was, who was highly disabled. And he said, do you suppose that God loves you more than he loves them because you can do more? It's an interesting question, isn't it? But here's the truth. No matter what you're going after in life, you're never even going to be able to protect it anyway. Right? Like if the economy were to collapse, a lot of us have like great savings and retirements. If everything were to collapse, I'm not saying it is. I'm not the conspiracy theorist guy that's like on conspiracy theory websites every week. My wife would disagree with that. But uh, if the economy were to collapse, you would have nothing. You, you couldn't do anything about it. You realize that, right? If all the banks were like, yep, no money. Like what's going on in Greece right now? They're like, hey, we're out of money. The, the, the people in Greece can't be like, oh, no, we got this handled. No, you don't. You have no money. It's, it's not there. And even with your family, it doesn't matter how much you love your family, you cannot ultimately protect them in the way that you think that you can. We ultimately cannot protect our nation in the way that we think that we can. Unless God is behind it, it's all in vain. And Jesus never promised to build our kingdom anyway. Jesus promised to build his. It's an eternal kingdom in Daniel 2.44. And in those, days, the kings, <clears throat> in those days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. See, the kingdom of God's building is not going to go away. It's eternal. It's also unshakable in Matthew chapter 16. Verses 15 through 19, if you turn there with me. Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 19. 
He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. See, this is an unshakable kingdom. But here's the deal with the kingdom. When God promises to build his kingdom and not ours, it means that if we want to be in on what God's building, first you must forsake your life for it. You have to give up what you want for it. If you want to build a kingdom that will never be shaken, that will never fade away, that all the things that the kingdom is about, you'll ultimately be able to eternally hold on to, you have to give up every idea of what you have in your mind as the perfect life from a humanistic perspective. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. <clears throat> Jesus shows up and begins his ministry after uh, being baptized by John the Baptist and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So what does that mean for us? Repent and believe the gospel. Repent means to turn away. If you're walking after the things that you desire for yourself, you turn around and you walk after Jesus. But you can only do that if you have been born again. You can only receive the kingdom supernaturally. Look at John 3, 3. In a discussion with Nicodemus, Jesus says to Nicodemus, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, we can't, we can't get the kingdom of God naturally. Our hearts won't see it. We're blinded to it. And so we build for ourselves. And Jesus says, if you want to be in on this kingdom, if you want to be in on what I'm building, you must be born again. And that gives us just as many problems as it gave Nicodemus. So what are you seeking to build and how can you tell? Like today, how could you tell? And this is not, listen, this is not just for adults in here. This is for young people too. If you're in here and you're a young person, you already have an idea of what you want your life to look like. Even right now. And if what you have in your mind as, as the perfect life, if you're just going after the things that you think will make yourself feel better, you're going to have a lifelong sorrow of never really being able to acquire what you think is going to make you happy. And you learn that from us because you watch us seek our own kingdom. What are you seeking to build? What, what kingdom do you want to be a part of? And how can you tell? Well, here's what I think. And I think Scripture testifies to this as well. I think the question we can ask ourselves is, where is my greatest anxiety? What am I most nervous about, frustrated about? On a, on a weekly basis, what do I get most stressed out about? Because that's probably where our idols are. That's probably where we're relying on our, ourselves to build something. And we're not trusting in God. We're not wanting, we're not looking and seeing, you know, where is God at work building his kingdom? We want to build our own kingdom and then have God kind of squeeze into it. And it makes us nervous because, because we think, wow, am I going to be able to keep what I'm building? Or will I be able to build what I want? Not only has the Lord promised to build his kingdom, but Secondly, the Lord has promised us rest. The Lord has promised us rest. Look at verse 2 in Psalm 127. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. I love that verse. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest. That's my favorite. I've said uh, the, the last two services... Pastors uh, Randy and, and Robin and Jason, they all have like these 6 a.m. Bible studies. And I'm like, I'd be happy to do one at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Most people are at work. But I'd be happy to do that. If you want to meet with me and you're like, let's get together at 6 o'clock, I'm probably going to oversleep. Okay, that's just if anybody is ever like, hey, let's get together. And I say 6, just slap me because that's probably not going to happen. 
It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about anxiety. So many of us, as we're trying to build our kingdom, as we're trying to get our lives the way that we want them to be, we are working so hard at trying to formulate this life that we eat the bread of anxious toil. We, we, we have anxiety even when we're trying to enjoy the things that we're working for because we're always working to enjoy things that we can never fully enjoy because we know we still have to work for them. It's this weird cycle, right? It's like people are like, I got to work. If you're a homeowner, you know exactly what I'm saying. It's like, well, I got to keep the value of my house up, so I got to do a bunch of stuff to my house. But I can't enjoy my house because I got to do more stuff to the outside of my house. And I'm always on the outside of my house, so I can't even sit on the inside of my house and enjoy how nice my house is because I got to do more stuff to the outside of my house. Amen? I want to live in a shipping container. With no yard, just dirt, a shipping container and dirt with a couch. We toil at making money, we toil at saving money, we toil in building our family, and we can't even enjoy the reason that we're doing it. We eat the bread of anxious toil. We work so hard to build something that we know if we don't sustain it in our humanity, it's going to go away. And maybe... Just maybe we can see the truth that if you have to work that hard to sustain something, maybe God is not behind it. It doesn't mean we don't work hard. You can look all through the Proverbs and see that hard work is a value. But hard work for the sake of having stuff and things and building your own kingdom, that is not a value. Not a kingdom value. Anxiety is often the result of a continual hunger for something more or better than what you currently have. You're either desperately trying to build something or you're desperately trying to keep something. And that comes in a variety of areas. It could be, it could be in money and building up our own house. It could be in, in our children and, and the stressor of trying to make sure that they turn out exactly the way that we want them to or they have everything we think they should have. Now, here's what this verse does not mean. I want to clear this up. This verse does not mean you will sleep like a baby. When it says that he he gives to his beloved sleep, that doesn't mean like, oh yeah, if Jesus loves me, I'm going to sleep really well. Look, if you have problems sleeping, it's not because God doesn't love you. Well, I mean, it, it, it might be because you're not right with the Lord, but that's not the case all the time. If you're having problems sleeping, it doesn't mean that God is not favorable towards you. Ironically, I slept the worst this week I've ever slept in my entire life, and I was stressing out about that verse. I was like, what does this mean? He gives to his beloved sleep, and I can't sleep this week. It does not mean you'll sleep like a baby. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that God will remove stressors from your life. A lot of us think that when we're in on God's kingdom, that means everything's going to be awesome. It's going to be easy. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be smooth sailing. And that's not true. We are sanctified often through difficulty. Right? That's why Jesus was like, look, the road is narrow and it's hard. If you want to walk the wide, easy pathway, feel free but it's going to end in destruction. It doesn't mean God will remove stressors from your life. And it also does not mean you should just be lazy. Young men, and ex- take, take it from me. I, I, I had the experience of being a young man who sort of w- had a hard time deciding what I wanted to do when I was in my early to mid-20s. So I spent a, quite a bit of time going back to my parents' home if you're between the ages of 20 and 30 and, you, and your only aspirations are to sit at home in your parents' basement and play Xbox, you got problems. Get out of the house and work. Parents, amen? But what John Calvin says about this verse to help clear it up, he says, thus their hands are not idle, but their minds repose in the stillness of faith as if they were asleep. See, when he says he, he gives to his beloved rest or peaceful sleep, what he's saying is that when we are focused on God, when we are about what he is building, then the anxieties of this life can sort of go away because we're not worried about what he's going to take care of. It's almost like as, we're, if, as if we're asleep, Right? We can look at life and say, well, this didn't go exactly how I wanted it to go, but I know that God's in control. Look, Jesus says it. Look at Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 34. And he said to his disciples, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or about your body, what you'll put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn and yet God feeds them, right? 
of how much more value are you than the birds? This 25, if you missed 25, this is just awesome. Can we just say how, the Bible is so awesome. I mean, God's word is so amazing. Jesus is so funny and smart. Look at verse 25. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? Okay, this is funny. Watch this next one. If you are not able to do as small a thing as that, that's all. That's hilarious. Jesus is like, which one of you can add an hour to your life? And if you can't do that small of a thing, that small of a thing, Jesus is like, if you can't manipulate time and space, if you can't handle that tiny matter of manipulating time and space to make your life longer, that's, come on, y'all, that's funny. <laughs> then why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. All the things that Solomon built, Jesus said, doesn't matter what Solomon built. He was not arrayed as beautifully as the flowers in the field that do nothing but sit there and grow because God has taken care of them. He goes on to say, you know, if God clothes the grass, how much more will he clothe you? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, right? Don't eat the anxious, the bread of anxious toil. Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried for all the nations of the world seek after these things. And your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek what? His kingdom. And these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the life that you want. No, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And correct me if I'm wrong, but for almost every one of us in here, the natural inclination of our heart is to treasure ourselves more than we treasure anyone else anything else, especially God, because our hearts are constantly making idols. We would like to worship ourselves. We worship our own intellect. We worship our own skill. We worship our own abilities. We treasure ourselves. So are you building your own kingdom or are you about the kingdom of God? And are you anxious because you know you can't hold on to what you ultimately can't build anyway? The last thing that the Lord promises us in this passage of Scripture is He promises us a heritage of spiritual children. In verses 3 through 5, Behold, children are heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb will reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior. The children of, of one's youth, blessed is the man who his, fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Now, I just love it when sermons line up with what's going on in, in popular culture. They always do, by the way, because the Bible is always relevant. When people are like, well, I don't know how we're going to make the Bible relevant. You don't make the Bible relevant to culture. You make culture relevant to the Bible. It's always relevant. Children are not precious for the promise of who they can be. Children are the precious for the reality of who they are. And Scripture tells us they're a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And as I watched a video this week, you know, and, and my big deal with the, the Planned Parenthood video this week, if you've seen it, if you haven't seen it, you should probably check it out. If you have seen it, my big deal wasn't even with the money stuff and selling. My big deal is when somebody can say, people are really looking for intact hearts about a child. If that story was about kittens or puppies, people would lose their ever-loving minds. From cover to cover, if I know one thing about God, if, if there is one thing I could say with surety that I know about God from, from Scripture, it's that He hates Abortion, period. And there may be some in here who have been part of experiencing an abortion. And if you have, I want to tell you that there is no sin that is outside the reaches of God's mercy. There is no sin that is outside the reaches of God's grace. But a child in the womb 
is a life. And it's precious. And we are a society so prone to look at the worth of the individual as being directly correlated to their ability to contribute. How did we get here in society? It's because we want to build our own kingdom so badly that we will take anything out that will get in the way of building what we want, including a life. And before you think it's all about people who don't know Christ, we have helped create this culture because we, we live in a society, even amongst Christians, where people often delay having children because they're like, well, I don't know how I'm going to... We've got so many things we want to accomplish before we have kids. I don't know if we're ready to have children. We have five, and we don't know if we're ready, and one of them is 14. My mom and dad have four. The oldest of us is 41, and I still don't think my mom's ready. Children are not about whether or not we're ready to handle them. God says they are a blessing. And why would we not look at that as an amazing reward from God? Incidentally enough, I think it's, this is also it's the same root why it's difficult to convince Christians to reach out and love the least of these. Because they're a nuisance to what we're trying to accomplish. Yes? Amen? Ouch? It's painful. And I want you to see something. that The value of a child is that they are from God, not because they are just a little person, but because they are from God. The Hebrew word here that's reward is sachar. And that means a direct benefit that God directly, a, a benefit that God directly bestows to man. A reward to man. Children are a reward from God to human beings. They don't just happen. God gives them. But as always, our thoughts, even of children, are far too human, and they get wrapped up in, in, a, in a humanistic view. So here's two humanistic ways of looking at this passage of Scripture that I want to correct, because I think it's important since it's coming up. Since it comes up in the text, I think it's important. The first is infertility. Children are not the reward to humanity. Jesus is. Okay? So let's just get that straight. Children are a reward. And if God blesses you with children, you take that for the reward that it is. My sister and her husband are unable to have children. And they've struggled with infertility. And it's hard for me because she is literally, she's the best aunt ever. And I see all these people who have children and they, they abandon them. And they raise them up to follow the flesh. And I look at my sister and my human gut reaction is, this is not fair. Yes, the male-female God-ordained union was initiated. You might think, well, why did God say man and woman would become one flesh? Because it was initiated to bear fruit and multiplying. But the entrance of sin made that act painful not only in labor but also in conception. There's two things I want to say to you if you struggled with infertility or are in the middle of the struggle. One is that your life is not less valuable if you can't have physical children. It's not less valuable. The second is you have to come to grips with God's sovereignty. Abraham and Sarah had a problem with that. And because they tried to go outside of God's will, they created a host of problems when Sarah said, yeah, sure, take Hagar and impregnate her and we'll get our child that way. That did not work. The second humanistic view is looking at this passage is the, the people that look at that thing that says, blessed is the man who fills his quiver with him. And they go, oh, okay, well, that means having a bunch of kids makes life better. The quiverful thing, well, you just keep having kids because God gives us children. We just keep having kids and keep having kids and keep having kids, and that means that God will be pleased when we keep having kids. The problem with that 
is, uh, I can show you something that Charles Spurgeon said. He said, when sons and daughters are arrows, it is well to have a quiver full of them, but if they are only sticks, knotty and useless, the fewer of them, the better. When he says like arrows in the hand of a warrior, listen, if you are taking great care with your own children, parents, listen to me. It is not just about having kids and then letting them determine what's best for their life. That is foolishness. If you are attaching to them biblical principles, you are holding Jesus up in front of them and saying, this is what you live for. This is how you live. If you hold up the word to them and say, thus saith the Lord, and that's the way you're raising your children, that is wonderful, okay? But you don't just turn them loose and just trust that God's going to do something awesome with a bunch of knotted sticks. He can. But you know what? You could have a quiver with two arrows in it, and if they're straight and true and you have a skilled archer using them, they'll hit their mark. If you have a big old bag with a bunch of knotted sticks, good luck hitting anything. Along with kids comes sin. Sin produces trial, and many trials require a whole lot of prayer and a whole lot of intentionality. Raising kids is hard, and we are not always guaranteed the, the results that we would like. And so some, when we look at passages about raising children, we're like, oh yeah, that's the way to have... Listen, the, the same is true. We can't look at this just naturally, right? The goal is spiritual children. Charles Spurgeon says, he who's the father of a host of spiritual children is unquestionably happy. Converts, converts. I'm going to say it again. Converts are emphatically the heritage of the Lord. Not just biological children. Converts are the heritage of the Lord. Spiritual children. You understand what I'm saying? So if you have biological children, you hit your knees and you pray and pray and pray that the Lord will convert them and that he will bear fruit in their lives and that they will be known to be children of God. If you have no biological children, you go out and you raise spiritual children by making converts. Christ himself promised, if you look at Matthew chapter 10, and I won't read all the verses, but write this down as a reference. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. How do I know that Jesus wasn't just about the biological family? It's because Jesus said the truth is, in a household where there's five Three are, three are going to be set against two. You, it's going to pit um, a dad against a son, a mother against a daughter. He said, do not be mistaken. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword and to divide. Because there are households in which you will have parents that love the Lord and children who don't. There are households in which you will have parents who hate the Lord and, uh, and children who love him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus doesn't promise us a shiny, happy family all the time. But he does promise us at the end of Matthew 10, 38 and 39, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. If you love your biological children more than you love Jesus, if you take greater care in raising your children for, to have a good life and what you think they should have to be successful, and you, you put them above Jesus, Jesus himself says, you are not worthy to follow me. That is painful, y'all, because I, I struggle with that. Jesus is clear. There is a house, a city, and an inheritance that is much more than what we see when we look at our lives. So what is he trying to tell us here? What can we take away from Psalm 127? Well, I think it's this. The truth is that God is building a house. God is building a house. God is building his kingdom. He's building something. 1 Peter 2, 5, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual what? House. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. God is building a house. He's building a spiritual house. And he's building it with believers. As we gather here today, believers, we are a spiritual house. God is building us up. Amen? Amen. Yeah, that's why we come together. That's why we don't just sit in our little enclaves inside our homes and high-five each other for what we're building there. We want to come together and say to each other, God is not building our individual kingdoms. He's building his, and we get to be a part of it together. We get to follow him together. So what do we do? We build with him. Center your life on God's word. 
Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So if God is building a house, what is this house to be built on? Christ Jesus is the cornerstone. So when we say together, brothers and sisters in Christ as believers, we are built on the finished work of Jesus Christ. But we come to know how to live that out through God's word, the apostles and the prophets. So we build our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ built up in his word. And far too often, the most Bible that many people in churches get is when they show up on Saturday nights or Sunday mornings and hear a sermon. And it's an awful lot of, hmm, I never heard that. And then they go back into their homes and don't spend a wink opening the word of God through the week with anybody else. That is a shame, and you will never really be built up if that is your life. You center your life on the Word. It's like when Charles Spurgeon said about John Bunyan, if you cut him, he would bleed bibline, which means if somebody strikes us, if somebody cuts us, that we are so immersed in God's Word that it just oozes out of who we are. What are you building? Are you in the building of the church on the foundation of God's word? Are you searching the word daily to see if what we from, from the pulpit are telling you is actually true? Are you Berean? The second thing is that God is watching over the city. God is watching over the city. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to get in trouble. I'll tell you what, when we say God is watching over the city, we're not saying God is watching over America. It's true that God is watching over every nation, but that's not the city that's going to rule, guys. That's not it. Isaiah 62, 12, and they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. In the book of Revelation, when the city comes down, it's the bride of Christ. Yes? It's the bride of Christ. It's a city not forsaken. So if, if God is watching the city, if we can trust that God is the one who is protecting the, the, the government of his authority, what he's building, if God is protecting it, then what do we do as believers? We watch for the king. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a watchman. And in, in Scripture, the, the function of a watchman was to stand on the wall and, and tell if there was a threat. And there are passages of Scripture that God says, I, I've appointed you as a watchman. And if a threat comes and you fail to warn the people, their blood is on your head. If a threat comes and you do warn the people and they, they refuse anyway, then their blood is on their head. But guys, what does this mean? We can't just sit by and go, well, God's going to build it. I shouldn't say anything to anybody, right? We go proclaim the gospel. We watch for the king. We stay dressed. In Luke chapter 12, you see Jesus says, stay dressed for action, keep your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they can open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. We watch. We wait for Jesus. This world is not our home. We're just passing through, as the song says. We're waiting for a government, a city that, that will never be destroyed, the bride of Christ in all its beauty. And Jesus is watching over that and he will come back. And in the meantime, we live in such a way that we would not be ashamed if Jesus were to bust through those doors right now. We wouldn't cower in fear because we would know that our whole life is built on him and living for him. And not only do we do that, but we warn other people, look, in the city of God is where you're going to find protection. Not out there. Not outside of God's will, not outside of God's word, not outside the testimony of Scripture. If you want protection, if you want to be God, under God's protection, you humble yourself to the king and you ask for mercy. And we tell people that. You're not loving. You're not loving if you just high-five people in their sin because you don't want to offend them, okay? You're loving if you tell people there's going to be a day where Jesus comes back. And if you're outside the city of God, if you're outside the blessing of being one of God's people, he's going to destroy you. It's not a popular message, which is why the road that's wide and leads to destruction is full of a bunch of people. It's not popular, but it's true. So we watch for the king and we warn others that there's refuge only in the city. And the last thing is that God is blessing us with an eternal inheritance. Colossians 1, 11 through 14 
may be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So if God is leaving us an inheritance, look at this. He has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Who am I sharing my inheritance with? Leave a spiritual legacy. And the question that we can ask is, who am I leading spiritually? Look, I know people who have no biological children, but in truth, they have more children than anyone I've ever seen. You understand what I'm saying? That when they stand, look, when they stand before the Lord, you can have one person who has 17 biological children that don't know the Lord, and they'll stand before the Lord, and God will spit them all out because they don't know him. Or you could have a person that has thousands of spiritual children who they've built into and taught Scripture and fed through Scripture, and God will say to those, well done. Come into glory. And, and here's how spiritual babies are made. You don't have to cover the ears of your kids. It's okay. Spiritual babies are made through birth. In John chapter 3, God says, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. So you share the gospel with someone and God does the work of opening their heart to receive it. You celebrate with them and you're like, awesome. And then you help to feed them, right? As parents, we would never sit our kids down at the table and just talk about food and never give them food. But a lot of times as Christians, we talk about the Bible and we talk about following Jesus, but we never sit down with somebody who's a baby Christian and actually show them what the Bible says. What kind of legacy are we leaving for them? And ultimately, the, the desire is that they would be able to stand in the gate, right? When he speaks with his enemies in the gate, the gate was the place of, um, of legal matters in the city. Ultimately, our desire for leaving a spiritual legacy is that those that we raise up would be able to stand in that gate and give an account for their lives in front of the Lord. So what are you building? Are you trying to build your own kingdom or are you in on what God is building? And just a, a, one reminder, the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, and I'm just going to briefly say this. Somebody comes to Jesus and says, teacher, tell my brother to divide my inheritance with me. This is a guy who's trying to build his own kingdom. It's hilarious. Jesus says, hey, who made me a judge or arbitrator over, over you guys? I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to decide this. And he says to them, tells them a parable. He says, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, you have ample goods built up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You know, after we partake in communion, we're going to sing, uh, we're going to sing the song, and it says, uh, who you love, I'll love. Who you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. And my question to us is, if, if you were given the question right now, if you were given the choice that you had, in order to follow Jesus Christ, you had to give up everything that you treasured most in your life right now outside of Jesus. Everything. Family, money, home, car, job, everything. Would you do it? Seriously, would you do it? And I think far too many of us love this life so much that we don't want to lose it. We might say, oh yeah, I would, I would be martyred for Jesus, but we won't give up the kingdom that we're building for Jesus. He says, if you won't do that, you're a fool. You're a fool. If you're in here today and you are all about building your life and you have not bowed the knee before Jesus Christ, Jesus himself says you're a fool. You're trying to hold on to ultimately what you will never be able to hold on to. And you're forsaking the one thing that would give you life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that it would cut us open, that it would help us to really ponder the question, would we leave everything to follow you? Lord, everything, everything behind. If there's nothing more precious than you, Lord, help us turn our hearts and help us to, uh, to repent of the sin of trying to hold on to this world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I didn't notice it until this morning, but that's a dangerous song, guys. <laughs> that's a dangerous song. This is when we say, if this life I lose, I'll I said it before, you know, would you be willing to give up everything? 
a lot of times when we come to church and we hear a sermon and stuff, we're searching our hearts going like, Jesus, which part of my life do you want? He's like, all of it. I don't want a part. I want all of it. And if you're not willing to give up everything for me, don't even bother. All of it. Are you willing to give all of it? All of it to follow him. No matter what it means. No matter what it costs. I will. You know why? Because I know I have brothers and sisters in Christ, the household of God, who will be right there with me. So let's not just rush out of here today. Let's take some time to spend it with brothers and sisters in Christ, and even maybe those who are in here who don't know Christ yet, and encourage them. The best place you can be 